Uh, hello everybody, uh, this video is looking at another key measurement of macroeconomic performance. In this video we're going to be looking at unemployment as a key measurement of macro performance. Right, what I would like you to do first of all please, can you put down in your books a definition for each of the following terms? So if you can now hit pause, write down your answers and hit play once you've put down your answers please. Right, so let's go through what some of these different key terms mean. Now, I'm going to start off by looking at employment, unemployment and underemployment. Now, if you're employed, it's obvious you're in work in exchange for a wage. So you go to work each day providing your labour in exchange for a wage. So you're generating an income by selling your labour. Unemployment is people who are not working, but they are actively seeking jobs. Now, if I add together those that are employed and unemployed, then we have the economically active people of the economy. They are the workforce or what we call the labour force of the economy. So if you are economically active, you are either employed or you are unemployed. Now, underemployment are people who are employed, so they're working, but they're not fully happy in work. Now, the reason for this is they're in a job that is below their skill level. So they're not fully utilising their skills. So they could do more. They could be more productive in um, a better skilled job. Or it's people who are working less hours than what they would like to. This could be people working part time who want full time work. It could be people stuck in zero hour contract work where they're not guaranteed full time hours each week. OK, so underemployed people are employed, but they're not really properly employed to their full potential, if you like. So remember, economically active includes the employed, the unemployed, but also the underemployed. Economically inactive is people of working age, so those from 16 to 64, who are neither employed nor unemployed. So it's people that are choosing not to look for work and choosing not to accept any jobs. So this is people who may be in full time education. It could be people who with disabilities or illnesses that prevent them from working. It could be people that choose to stay at home to look after children or the elderly relatives, or it could be those that have done well and have chosen just to retire early. OK, guys, so you've got there some really, really important key terms linked to unemployment theory. Right. What I would now like you to do, please, can you write down a range of causes of unemployment? So I'm looking for here for you to write down different examples of types of unemployment. Right. Hit pause. Write down your answers and then hit play, please. Right, guys. Now, first of all, then unemployment. What we said was it's people who are not working, but they are actively seeking employment. Now, all it does, all this really means is where the demand for workers is less than the supply of workers at the existing wage rate. So there was more people are willing and able to work than what businesses are willing and able to demand. Now, we've also got to be thinking about labour as a derived demand. The reason why businesses demand workers is because they need people to be producing output. So the demand for workers is based on the demand for output. So if businesses face a high demand for their goods and services, they'll recruit more workers. If there's a fall in demand for um, the output produced by their business, there'll be a lower demand for workers. Right, guys, now one type of um, unemployment which you need to be aware of is structural unemployment. Now, this is a very horrible, nasty, potentially long term type of unemployment. Uh, and this is often caused by industrial decline. So in the UK, for example, we've gone from something that we call deindustrialization. This is where the big old fashioned industries have been in decline. Shipbuilding, steel production, coal mining, etc. Now, the problem is that the people that worked in these industries had very, very specific skills. And these people um, can't use their skills in the new growth industries. So when you look at the UK economy, as these big industries have been declining, there's been a growth in um, industries linked to customer service, retail, hospitality, catering, um, ICT, marketing, financial services. And the problem is these people haven't got the skills to accept work in these new growth industries. 
Now, another thing we should say here, though, as well, is that the people that lost the jobs in these industries um, found that the new growth industries might be in different parts of the country. So you might lose your job working in, in a coal mine in South Yorkshire, but there were new jobs available in London. Now, the problem is that it's very difficult for people to relocate to different parts of the country. So what we have to say is that structural unemployment is linked to what we call geographical and occupational immobility of labour. So geographical immobility of labour, where people can't relocate or commute to jobs in different parts of the country, it's a barrier to working somewhere else. We also have occupational immobility, which where people lack appropriate skills to work in new growth industries. It's also worth noting, though, that um, structural unemployment can also exist because of the growth of technology. So more firms are more uh, are using capital to produce goods and services, so machines on production lines, etc., which means that labour has now been increasingly been replaced by capital. Well, that means that machines are now doing the job that people used to do. So those people have now got skills that are no longer demanded by the economy. Um, other types of unemployment, frictional unemployment. Now, this one is a very short term type of unemployment. It's people between jobs. It's people that happen to maybe leave one job and they're waiting to start a new job. It's that time to apply, be interviewed and accept a new job. Could even include people that um, are looking to change careers. So move from one industry to another. It could be a quick fix. It could be people that are leaving one stage of their life and they're entering a new one. So it could be mums or dads that have taken time off to bring up children and then decide to look for a new job. They might be unemployed for a short amount of time before they find jobs. It could even be students leaving college looking for their first job or people university, leaving university looking for new work. Uh, we also have a type of unemployment called seasonal. And this is people who um, will be able to find work at certain times of the year, but other times in the year they might struggle for employment. Now, you tend to find seasonal unemployment uh, will exist in tourist industries. So say, for example, you live in a seaside town. When the tourists are there in the summer, there might be high demand for your labour, working in the arcades, the fish and chip shops, the hotels, the theme parks, etc. But in the winter months, lots of those businesses will shut down for the winter season. And that would mean those people will lose their jobs uh, during that time of the year. Now, cyclical unemployment is another type of unemployment. This one often occurs in a recession. Now, a recession is when GDP falls for at least six months. Well, logically, if firms have got falling order books for their goods and services, they've got spare workers they no longer need. So what they will do, they will shed, in other words, get rid of spare workers to make sure they're not paying for things they don't need to be paying for. So if you think about a restaurant, if they've got less customers using their restaurant, they need fewer waiters and waitresses. So due to that drop in demand, uh, they now need fewer staff working in their restaurant. Now, the next one um, is something we call real wage inflexibility. Now, um, think about supply and demand. Markets should clear where supply equals demand. Well, that should mean that um, if there was more people um, willing to supply their labour than what businesses are demanding, then wage rates should fall. Because if wage rates start to fall, then businesses will start to want to recruit more workers because they're now cheaper to get hold of. Now, the problem is we have something called sticky wages. And this is where wage rates can't fall to clear markets. So we get stuck with an excess supply of labour. And it could be things such as minimum wage rates. So uh, if we've still got unemployed people at minimum wage rates, then ultimately wage rates can't go down any further to find work for those people to do. So that would be an example of sticky wages. But we also have things such as trade union power that might prevent people from working on lower wage rates. So real wage inflexibility is linked to this idea that wage rates need to fall to get people back into work. But wage rates often can only fall so much. And if they can't fall any further and people are still unemployed, well, it's the market which is stopping people getting work. Sticky wage rates. Um, right. What I now want you to do is to think about what do you think the effects of unemployment are? So what are the impacts of unemployment on the economy? 
So try and write down for me a few different effects of unemployment. Um, so hit pause, write down your answers. Once they're down, click play. Right, now here we go then. Now we, we can think about the effects of unemployment on different economic agents. If we think about workers first of all, there are some huge impacts on workers. Uh, now obviously if you lose your job, your income drops and that makes it very difficult for you to meet your wants and needs which means that you cannot consume goods and services. This could lead to you falling into more debt because you might have to borrow more money to pay for bills while you're not working, but it also reduces your ability to save money. And that could mean that you're less able to invest into pension schemes. It could mean you're less able to save up deposits to buy your first home. Now, um, what it could also do though, if your income drops, it makes you less able to borrow money. So uh, if your credit rating falls because you're building up debt on, and savings are falling because I've been unemployed, it might mean in the future, you might find it more difficult to borrow from banks. Now, on top of that, though, as well, um, you tend to find that when you're unemployed, the quality of your human capital, your skills, in effect, starts to fall. Um, that is because whilst you're off work, you fall behind with new developments in your industry. So when you go back into the industry, you are less skilled than what you used to be. And that might mean you have to go back into work at a lower level than what you were in the first place. Uh, we also find as well that people who are unemployed find it more difficult to find work than people who are already employed that might want new jobs. And that's because when you're unemployed, there's a mark against your name and it can become very difficult to find new work. Businesses look at you and think, hang on, why has this guy not been working for a while? There must be a reason and that could mean these people become long term unemployed. Now, other problems could just be a loss of self-esteem. People are unemployed, you know, debt problems, feeling of worthlessness. It can lead to depression, anxiety and stress as well. But there is a benefit for workers. If you lose your job, you have got increased leisure time to spend with family and friends. Now, for businesses, unemployment is a big problem as well. If we've got a growth in the number of people unemployed across the economy, then it means that households have got less ability to buy output produced by businesses. But that means that firms face lower sales, profits will start to fall. Uh, that could affect their share prices, make it more difficult for businesses to borrow and to invest. And that can be a huge problem. Uh, we also have to be aware that uh, for businesses, getting rid of workers can be very expensive. If you need to um, reduce how many workers you employ, you've got to make these staff redundant. Well, that will carry a huge cost for the business. And of course, once you make those staff redundant, you lose not just the person, but the skills that you've invested into that person as well. But for some businesses, high unemployment across the economy can be quite good. Uh, the reason why is if you've got a huge pool of unemployed people, it means that when you do recruit, you can potentially get people at lower wage rates and potentially save a little bit of cash. Now, for the government, unemployment creates some huge problems. Um, unemployed people will, first of all, often be able to claim a job seekers allowance. So unemployment benefits, in effect, well, that carries a huge cost to the government. Uh, you also find that unemployment, which creates lots of poverty and inequality, can lead to uh, more need to help people out with he health care if they're falling into depression. You might have more crime, which might mean no more government spending on the police services. And people will need more support to pay for mortgages and rents, which creates more impacts on government spending. Now, governments also suffer not just by having to spend more money, but also in the fact that they need to, that they'll find their taxes falling as well. So due to high unemployment, firms make less profits. So they receive less corporation taxes from businesses. Um, households who are unemployed are no longer paying income tax and national insurance, which lowers tax revenue there. And also because people are buying less goods and services because they're unemployed, there's less VAT being paid as well. So, guys, the idea is then that when we've got high unemployment in the economy, there is a need for more government spending. And there will also be a drop in taxation revenue coming in for the government. This therefore means that the national debt will increase when unemployment is growing in society. OK, now on top of all that as well, um, if unemployment surges too high and businesses start to suffer, it's possible the government 
mighty to bail out big industries to prevent them prevent them from collapsing in effect to protect the future of the economy so unemployment is a disastrous thing for the government now in general then what we would say is that unemployment will lead to a drop in living standards it makes it more difficult to fund the public sector so that would pay for education and healthcare uh, or grade infrastructure like road networks in the future it might mean in the future we've got to raise tax rates to pay for it so there are some huge problems of unemployment across society right what I would now like is to think about how we measure unemployment. Can you now please write down for me in your books the difference between the ILO approach to measure unemployment and the claimant count? And then finally, can you write down for me the difference between the unemployment rate and the unemployment level? All right, hit pause and write down your answers. All right, here we go. Now, the ILO is the International Labour Organization way of measuring unemployment. Now, what we do here, we conduct market research. So we use the Labour Force Survey. So what will happen is every month, a certain number of households will be contacted and, that will, and they will be asked, what is your employment status? And from that, we can work out roughly across the country how many people are employed and how many people are unemployed. The claimant count is measuring unemployment by looking at how many people claim job seekers allowance. So there was how many people are going into the job centre and registering as unemployed to claim job seekers allowance. OK, so what I would say, though, is this often underestimates the true level of unemployment because not everyone unemployed will claim job seekers allowance. This could be due to the stigma, you know, uh, not wanting to admit to friends and family you're claiming unemployment benefits. But it could also be that you've got too much savings or your family's wealth is too high, which means that you might not be eligible to claim it. So the ILO is a survey used to calculate roughly what the unemployment is. The claimant count is looking at people claiming job seekers allowance. Now, finally, on this slide, we've got the unemployment rate and the unemployment level. Now, the unemployment level is just the number of people in the economy who are unemployed. In other words, not working, but actively seeking work. The unemployment rate measures the proportion of those that are economically active who are not employed. So what we would do, we would add up the number of people employed to the number of people unemployed and find out what proportion of those people are currently unemployed. So in the UK, roughly at the moment, in um, September 2020, the unemployment rate is 4.1%. This means that um, out of the workforce, 4.1% of people are unemployed. Right. Last questions, everyone. It's really, really important that you understand the impacts of immigration and emigration on labour markets. So what I would now like to do, please, write down definitions for the following. What do we mean by immigration, emigration, net migration, brain drain? And what do you think the impacts or the effects of immigration are? So again, write down your answers. So hit pause right now. And when your answers are complete, hit play. Right, guys, now here's the last slide then um, in this video migration and its impacts on employment now immigration is where people move into our economy so this could be people from europe moving into our economy emigration is where people leave an economy so this could be um people move from britain to go live in spain migration is simply where people move between countries okay so it would look at both immigration and emigration now net migration We'll be looking at immigration, so the number of people coming into your economy, take away the people leaving your economy. Now, if you've got more immigration than emigration, it means your population's increasing. If you've got more emigration than immigration, then you've got um, population levels falling. Now, you've got here then the impacts on the economy of immigration. Now, what you could argue is it will create more jobs. Because when you've got more people moving into your economy, you've got more people demanding goods and services. Labour is a derived demand. So if you've got more people demanding goods and services, well, that means that you need more people working to um, produce the extra output required. 
What it will also do, though, is increase the supply of labour. If you've got loads of people flooding into your economy every year looking for work, you've got a bigger supply of labour. And what that can do, it can bring down wage rates for some for some professions. OK, now again, though, that lower wage rate that happens because of that would lead to an increased demand for workers. But everyone, this is one reason why some people are anti-immigration. If you've got lots of people moving into your economy, that big extra supply of workers can push down wage rates. Now, what that can also then do is to create more unemployment. More immigration creates more competition for jobs. And that can mean that immigrants might struggle to find work while they're unemployed. But also, if, they're, if the immigrants are taking jobs away from domestic workers, it means that domestic people um, are finding it more difficult to find work, so are more likely to be unemployed. Um, one other impact, though, of immigration is an improvement in human capital. If you've got more people moving into your economy, it's going to create potential economic growth. It'll make that PPF move outwards. This means that firms have got a bigger access to workers with more skills, and that it might even help businesses fill what we call skill gaps. A skill gap is where there's a job available, but you cannot recruit people within your economy with those skills. Well, if you can now import people through immigration to do that job, it will tackle that skill gap in businesses. Now, it also tackles labour shortages. There are certain industries like agriculture and nursing in the UK where we can't get hold of enough skilled people to do the jobs. Immigration allows us to fill those gaps. Now, effects of emigration, people leaving your economy, is the opposite of those. It will create a lower demand for output, which could lead to jobs being lost. Emigration also means the supply of labour falls, which can lead to higher wage rates, um, more skill gaps, more uh, sorry, less unemployment in the economy. Uh, but it's also worth noting as well that when you lose high skilled workers from your economy, we call it brain drain. So that loss of skills means that the abilities within your workforce are less than what they were before. Now, poor economies, though, they do benefit from their workers emigrating to richer countries. And that's because of remittances. So when people, for example, leave poor economies in Africa and Asia to go live and work in America or Europe, they will earn more money and they can send back a proportion of those wages back to their family and friends back in their home economy. So, guys, you've got there um, unemployment. I will hang up there and say thank you very much.